what you have to do to this week is you have to read this essay um, about love. And the reason you're reading this essay is because um, Romeo and Juliet is a lot about love. It's also about loyalty and fighting and who are you loyal to or who are you loyal to and so forth. But really, um, it's it's about love and what does love mean and that sort of thing. Um, and so in order before you start Romeo and Juliet, you are um, reading this essay called Love's Vocabulary. If you struggle with reading it on your own, you can listen to me read it. That's all I'm really doing right now is going to read through this. So if you are a um, audio person that you learn better hearing it, then go ahead and listen. It's not required, but here you go. So the essay is called Love's Vocabulary. It is by Diane Ackerman, who is the author of A Natural History of the Senses, Senses An Alchemy of Mind, and The Zookeeper's Wife. She weaves her love of science and natural history into her poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. Her memoir, 100 Names for Love, chronicles her husband's struggle to reclaim language after a stroke. In describing that time, Ackerman said, I've always transcended best by pretending that I'm Margaret Mead, viewing a scene for the first time or an alien from another planet regarding the spectacle of life on Earth and discovering how spectacular, unexpected, and beautiful it is. So here is her essay. And what you want to pay attention to, um, which will help you on the quiz, is to pay attention to many creative descriptions of love, like how she describes it throughout the essay. Love is the great intangible. In our nightmares, we can create beasts out of pure emotion. Hate stalks the streets with dripping fangs. Fear flies down narrow alleyways on leather wings and jealousy spins sticky webs across the sky. In daydreams, we can maneuver with poise, foiling an opponent, scoring high on fields of glory, while crowds cheer, cutting fast to the heart of an adventure. But what dream state is love? Frantic and serene, vigilant and calm, wrung out and fortified, explosive and sedate. Love commands a vast army of moods, hoping for victory, limping from the latest skirmish. Lovers enter the arena once again. Sitting still, we are as daring as gladiators. When I set a glass prism on a windowsill and allow the sun to flood through it, a spectrum of colors dances on the floor. What we call white is a rainbow of colored rays packed into a small space. The prism sets them free. Love is the white light of emotion. It includes many feelings which out of laziness and confusion, we crowd into one simple word. Art is the prism that sets them free. Then follows the gyrations of one or a few. When art separates this thick tangle of feelings, love bears its bones, but it cannot be measured or mapped. Everyone admits that love is wonderful and necessary, yet no one can agree on what it is. I once heard a sportscaster say of a basketball player, he does all the intangibles, just watch him do his dance. As lofty as the idea of love can be, no image is too profane to help explain it. Years ago, I fell in love with someone who was both a sport and a pastime. At the end, he made fade away jump shots in my life. But for a while, love did all the intangibles. It lets us do our finest dance. Love, what a small word we use for an idea so immense and powerful it has altered the flow of history, calmed monsters, kindled works of art, cheered the forlorn, turned tough guys to mush, consoled the enslaved, driven strong women mad, glorified the humble, fueled national scandals, bankrupted robber barons, and made mincemeat of kings. How can love's spaciousness be conveyed in the narrow confines of one syllable? If we search for the source of the word, we find a history vague and confusing, stretching back to the Sanskrit lubiati, he desires. I'm sure the etymology rambles much farther, back much farther than that, to a one-syllable word heavy as a heartbeat, 
Love is an ancient delirium, a desire older than civilization, with tap roots stretching deep into dark and mysterious days. We use the word love in such a sloppy way that it can mean almost nothing or absolutely everything. It is the first conjugation students of Latin learn. It is a universally understood motive for crime. Ah, he was in love, we sigh. Well, that explains it. In fact, in some European and South American countries, even murder is forgivable if it was a crime of passion. Love, like truth, is the unassailable defense. Whoever first said love makes the world go round, it was an anonymous Frenchman, probably was not thinking about celestial mechanics, but the way love seeps into the machinery of life to keep generation after generation in motion. We think of love as a positive force that somehow ennobles the one feeling it. When a friend confesses that he's in love, we congratulate him. In folk stories, unsuspecting lads and lasses ingest a love potion and quickly lose their hearts. As with all intoxicants, love comes in many guises and strengths. It has a mixed bouquet and may include some piquant ingredients. One's taste in love will have a lot to do with one's culture, upbringing, generation, religion, era, gender, and so on. Ironically, although we sometimes think of it as the ultimate oneness, love isn't monotone or uniform. Like a batik created from many emotional colors, it is a fabric whose pattern and brightness may vary. What is my goddaughter to think when she hears her mother say, I love Ben and Jerry's Jerry Garcia ice cream. I really loved my high school boyfriend. Don't you just love this weather? I'd love to go to the lake for a week this summer. Mommy loves you. Since all we have is one word, we talk about love in increments or unwieldy ratios. How much do you love me? A child asks, because the parent can't answer, I, verb that means unconditional parental love, you. She may fling her arms wide as if welcoming the sun and sky, stretching her body to its limit, spreading her fingers to encompass all of creation and say this much or think of the biggest thing you can imagine now double it i love you 100 times that much when elise elizabeth barrett browning wrote her famous sonnet how do i love thee she didn't count the ways because she had an arithmetical turn of mind but because english poets have always had to search hard for personal signals of their love as a society, we are embarrassed by love. We treat it as if it were an obscenity. We reluctantly admit to it. Even saying the word makes us stumble and blush. Why should we be ashamed of an emotion so beautiful and natural? In teaching writing students, I've sometimes given them the assignment of writing a love poem. Be precise, be individual, and be descriptive, but don't use any cliches, I caution them, or any curse words. Part of the reason for this assignment is that it helps them understand how inhibited we are about love. Love is the most important thing in our life, a passion for which we would fight or die. And yet we're reluctant to linger over its name. Without a supple vocabulary, we can't even talk or think about it directly. On the other hand, we have many sharp verbs for the ways in which human beings can hurt one another. Dozens of verbs for the subtle gradations of hate but there are pitifully few synonyms for love. Our vocabulary of love and love making is so paltry that a poet has to choose among cliches, profanities, or euphemisms. Fortunately, this has led to some richly imagined works of art. It has inspired poets to create their own private vocabularies. Mrs. Browning sent her husband a poetic abacus of love, which in a roundabout way expressed the sum of her feelings. Other loves have tried to calibrate their love in equally ingenious ways. In The Flea, John Dunn watches a flea suck blood from his arm and his beloved's and rejoices that their blood marries in the flea's stomach. Yes, lovers are most often reduced to comparatives and quantities. Do you love me more than her? We ask. Will you love me less if I don't do what you say? We are afraid to face love head on. 
We think of it as sort of a traffic accident of the heart. It is an emotion that scares us more than cruelty, more than violence, more than hatred. We allow ourselves to be foiled by the vagueness of the word. After all, love requires the utmost vulnerability. We equip someone with freshly sharpened knives, strip naked, then invite him to stand close. What could be scarier? If you took a woman from ancient Egypt and put her in an automobile factory in Detroit, she would be understandably disoriented. Everything would be new, especially her ability to stroke the wall and make light flood the room. Touch the wall elsewhere and fill the room with summer's warm breezes or winter's blast. She would be astonished by telephones, computers, fashions, language, and customs. But if she saw a man and a woman stealing a kiss in a quiet corner, she would smile. People everywhere and every when understand the phenomenon of love, just as they understand the appeal of music, finding it deeply meaningful even if they cannot explain exactly what that meaning is, or why they respond viscerally to one composer and not another. Our Egyptian woman who prefers the bird-like twittering of a sistrum, and a 20th century man who prefers the clashing jaws of heavy metal, share a passion for music that both would understand. So it is with love. So is it with love. Values, customs, and protocols may vary from ancient days to the present, but not the maj majesty of loves. People are unique in the way they walk, dress, and gesture, yet we're able to look at two people, one wearing a business suit, the other a sarong, and recognize that both of them are clothed. Love also has many fashions, some bizarre and to our taste shocking, others more familiar, but all are a part of the phantasmagoria we know. In the Serengeti of the heart, time and nation are irrelevant. On that plane, all fires are the same fire. Remember the feeling of an elevator falling in your chest when you said goodbye to a loved one? Parting is more than sweet sorrow. It pulls you apart when you are glued together. It feels like hunger pains and we use the same word, pang. Perhaps this is why Cupid is depicted with a quiver of arrows, because at times love feels like being pierced in the chest. It is a wholesome violence. Common as childbirth, love seems rare nonetheless, always catches one by surprise and cannot be taught. Each, children re each child rediscovers it, each couple redefines it, each parent reinvents it. People search for love as if it were a city lost beneath the desert dunes, where pleasure is the law. The streets are lined with brocade cushions and the sun never sets. If it's so obvious and popular, then what is love? I began researching this book because I had many questions, not because I knew at the outset what answers I might find. Like most people, I believed that what I had been told, that the idea of love was invented by the Greeks and romantic love began in the Middle Ages. I now know how misguided such hearsay is. We can find romantic love in the earliest writings of our kind. Much of the vocabulary of love and the imagery lovers use has not changed for thousands of years. Why do the same images come to mind when people describe their romantic feelings? Custom, culture, and taste vary, but not love itself and not the essence of the emotion.